Okay? And there's some interesting things in Magna Carta. For example, 21 here, paragraph 21. Henceforth the writ which is called Presby shall not be served on anyone for any holding so as to cause a free man to lose his court. If you're a free man, you have your court, right? These are ancient concepts. Now, in a recent demur that I received from an attorney, he, when, when he had read our paperwork uh, citing the common law, he said that was quaint. Now, my word for quaint is precedence. Okay? Well, he used that too. He said both. Actually, I think it was two different places. One was quaint and the other was archaic. But, you know, I call it precedence. <clears throat> now, I don't know. Maybe precedence is a new idea to attorneys. <laughs> but, anyway, this is a precedent. This is, this, is a, a, this is a concept that's rock solid. All right, let's see. We cannot say with assurance that under the allegations of the pro se complaint, which we hold to less stringent standards than formal pleadings drafted by lawyers, it appears beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts in support of his claim, which would entitle him to relief. Okay? Also, an act of the court shall prejudice no man. All right? So we've got some interesting authorities. All right, so the court took judicial notice of these various things. Then, the next thing the court did is we made some findings of fact. All right? And here's what the sovereign court found, as a matter of fact. The court, on its own motion, makes the following findings of fact, based upon the court record and upon the contents of the judicial notice dated May 5th, 1999. We just read that judicial notice. Number one, William Jones is one of the people as contemplated in the preamble of the California Constitution. Second fact, the court is a court of record. And the third fact, all parties and court personnel have been properly apprised of the foregoing. Because that's what he said in, in, his, in his action. Okay, very simple. That's all there is to that one. Okay, that was the court. And that was signed by William Jones, Atronatus Provatus. All right, if we look at the top of the caption here, you see Atronatus Provatus, right? Right up there. <clears throat> That's Latin for private attorney. No, no, it's not a blanket rule. You just don't want to be an attorney representing yourself in their court. Okay? But in your own court, in this case, <clears throat> William Jones, it's true he's a plaintiff, William Jones is also the sovereign and William Jones in the capacity of Atronatus Privatus or private attorney he is representing the court because you see the court consists of the sovereign the person of the sovereign and the suit of the sovereign together they make an artificial fictitious entity and the artificial fictitious entity has no voice so it must have a spokesman, an attorney, to speak for it, to make commitments for it, because the the court of the the uh, the court is not a live entity. It's a fiction created out of two elements. One is the person of the sovereign, and the other is the suit of the sovereign. Okay. So in order to speak with the voice, you get an attorney. So. A private attorney is different from a public attorney. A public attorney is the normal attorney you're familiar with. A private attorney is an attorney who does not hold his attorney services out to the public, but instead is the attorney only for one specific purpose. In this case, he's representing the court. And so he signs it down below by, okay, you'll notice it's the court that's issuing the order it is by William Jones, private attorney. Okay? And you don't see it on here, but over on the right side, we put a real pretty gold seal. Okay? We seal it. Signed, sealed, and delivered. You've heard that? Yes. Can you also use the term master? No. Repeat the question. No. 
could, you, could he use the term master? And the answer is no, because a master is kind of like a magistrate, a judge. Okay? And, the, by the way, the, ju- the, the magistrate can sign also as long as he doesn't originate the order. The order has to come from the court. Because basically, the private attorney... <coughs> The private attorney is nothing more than a witness to the order. Okay? That's it. That's all it is, a witness to the court, what the court did. And we put the court seal on it. That's important. So in all orders, we put a court seal. And we we went to, um, basically all you have to do is go to um, Office Depot, or pretty much any stationers and you can order a corporate seal and on the corporate seal you can put anything you want as long as you at least have the word seal and and you can put your name your birth date uh, some phrase you have some model or whatever it is that's fine but that is your seal and so we we take this gold seal this uh, it's like a, a stamp some of them you lick some of them are pre-glued and you put it on the, on the paper and then you have a seal that crimps it and you stand, it really looks pretty. And it also copies well, believe it or not. Even though there's no ink, when you put it on a copy machine, because it re- re- reflects unevenly, you get uh, very good copies off of that seal when you do a copy, when you use the gold. So anyway, that's, that's the court order, okay? For, and this is a court order making a finding of fact. Then... The next thing is, this is the real meat right here, the writ of error, where we reverse the magistrate. Now, whenever you issue an order, a sovereign order, you're not a judge. See, if you were a judge, you would have a certain amount of, you might say, presence, acceptance, this kind of thing. So, if you issue an order uh, as a judge, you don't explain it, you just issue it. Oh, let me tell you a little secret. I don't know how it is in other states, but in California, if a trial lasts under, I think it's eight hours, then you must tell the judge in advance of the decision that you want him to explain the decision. If he makes the decision first, he can ignore your request for an explanation. So you must always, you can do it verbally, I suggest you do it in writing. Okay, just a, just a little, uh, you can say, uh, request for explanation of judgment, something like that. But it, you, you then, uh, you let him know. because And once you let him know, he's obligated by the rules of the court to make the explanation. If the trial goes over eight hours, I think, or something like, there's some time, you have to look at the rules, see what it is then you have a day or two in which, which to decide you want an explanation. So, guess what? They try to make all these trials short, don't they? Under the four-hour or eight-hour limitation, whatever it is. All right. However, we're not judges. We're in a very unusual position. The common law is not strong in the United States. Um, the, uh, the balance of power has been pretty well upset. So, consequently, we have to lean very heavily on being right doing our paperwork correctly, and when we make a decision, we have to explain it. And we do. At all times, we explain it. So here we have a, a uh, very long explanation on this writ of error. This is a writ of error, quorum nobis resident. Okay? Now, there's no difference between a writ of error, quorum nobis resident, and a writ of error, quorum nobis. Okay? It's just more words. Part of every lawsuit is psychological warfare. Okay? So I put this writ of error quorum nobis, or QA, QA quorum nobis resident. You know why I put it there? Psychological warfare, of course. But the reason I put it there is because I knew they couldn't find it. They don't know where to look. <laughs> okay? I know where to look. I know it's valid. They don't know. I'm sure the judges don't know. Okay? So that makes them a little shaky. What's this guy got, right? That was the only reason for it. I could have just put rid of error without the quorum nobis. <laughs> but that's what I did.
But basically all it means is that the king is there in court himself and issuing the order. That's all it means. Resident means he's resident. He's there. And rid of error, we know what that means. Quorum nobis means by us, meaning our own court is correcting ourselves. And, uh, and uh, QA, I think, I forget uh, what that is. So I, I looked it up and I don't remember anymore. But <clears throat> when I was looking up rid of error, quorum nobis, I saw an explanation. Just looking up rid of error, quorum nobis. But, of course, when you do research, you try to be thorough. So I looked up River Quorum Vobus and saw what it had to say. And it had to say that a River Quorum Vobus was like a River Quorum Nobus, QA Quorum Nobus Resident, except that <coughs> it's from a higher court to a lower court. Some explanation like that. It used this phrase over in the Quorum Vobus explanation. And it mentioned in there also that uh, something about it was usually called Quorum Novus instead of all that other words. So, um, again, psychological warfare, okay? <clears throat> the court comes now to re review the facts, re record, and process resulting in the rulings dated February 18th, 1999. It shows that this court of record held a hearing on February 18th for, uh, for the purpose of considering defendants demur the plaintiff's personal um, action of trespass for damages. Plaintiff was present in personam and defendant, though absent, was represented by counsel. Okay? The record shows, transcripts page 1 to 9, that the magistrate did not conduct the hearing in accordance with either the stated rules of court, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, specified in action of trespass, page 1, line 19, or the foundation rules of a court of record. You'll notice how as we go through the paper, every point that's made is cited somehow. That's what gives strength to what you're doing. You don't just make a claim. You show, you allow the reader to go back and make his own conclusion. Okay? And, um, but this is what gives strength to your order. And, um, and so, let's see. Instead, the magistrate conducted his own court without notice or concurrence of the parties and without due process. In fact, at one point, the magistrate made it clear that he believed he was the owner of the courtroom. Transcript, page 2, line 20. That's where he said, my courtroom. <coughs> okay? <clears throat> Not satisfied with the lawful rules of court, he became a loose cannon and at some points imposed his own rules. See transcript, page 1, lines 13 to 15. 18, page 2. Okay? Page 3. <laughs> page 4. All right? So it goes. And other points... And other points, rules of another jurisdiction foreign to this court. See transcript, page one, and so forth. So we just go boom. We just point right at this is where he misbehaved. In the exchange between plaintiff and magistrate, the magistrate made it perfectly clear that the fact that this is a court of record was of no consequence to him. In two words, so what? See transcript, page nine. <laughs> okay? Further... Without proper authority, the magistrate stepped out of his function as a magistrate and by his actions and statements figuratively assumed the cloak of a tribunal. Page 5, lines, this is where he's making a decision, right? The genius of a court of record is not to be undermined. It is the birthright of every American to settle issues in a court of record if he so chooses. Throughout the transcript, the record shows that the rules of the court were not followed, that the magistrate attempted to function as a tribunal and that the court was ineffective in furthering the goal of justice for all. You see, when you write these decisions, you've got to be neutral. You're not talking for the plaintiff. You're not talking for the defendant. You're talking right down the center, and whatever decision comes out should be based on being in the center, evaluating all facts. So you cannot be biased when you write your own judgments, and it's really best to get someone else to write the judgment for you because it's hard not to be biased in your own cause, okay, even though you ultimately will sign it. So... These failures to follow the prescribed procedures are sufficiently disruptive to the goal of providing fair justice that the court finds it necessary to issue a writ of error QE quorum nobis resident as follows. The court, having reviewed the facts, the record, and the process by which the ruling was issued, and finding that the magistrate rendered a ruling by applying rules from several jurisdictions foreign to this court without leave of court, in other words, without permission of the court, 
and finding that the orderly decorum of the court was replaced by defective impromptu process and usurpation of legislative and court powers without leave of court, who can make the law? Who has the legislative power? The sovereign does, you betcha. Okay? And finding that there is a par- is partial, get this now, and finding that there is partial merit in the defendant's demurrer, namely that the action, though barely sufficient, should contain should contain a complete statement of facts upon which to grant relief, and desiring that fair justice be served for all parties, defendant as well as plaintiff, now therefore the court issues this writ of error quorum novus resident to wit. The court rescinds all rulings entered Fe- mm-hmm. February 18, 1899. Or 1999. Further, the court orders that in the interest of justice and fair play to all parties, plaintiff and defendants, and with the concurrence of plaintiff, see, he couldn't order the plaintiff but the plaintiff agrees, okay, that the action for trespass is dismissed with, the, with prejudice if the plaintiff does not file a first amended action on or before June 8th. So what we did was we, we, we removed the, the magistrate's decision. We said, no, we said the defendant, when he did his demur, had a valid point. It should have been granted we are granting part of it and we're ordering, the court is turning around and ordering the plaintiff to revise the action within a given specific amount of time. We gave him 30 days to revise it, which is a reasonable time in court, in court time. That was the order. So now we set it up so that if he didn't get it filed in, then he, the plaintiff would be thrown out permanently. Okay, with prejudice. Got that? So we were, in the order, we were as hard on the plaintiff as we were on the magistrate. We were as hard on the plaintiff. As no, you came in as the plaintiff? No, we came in as the plaintiff. Start over. Start over. The plaintiff is suing because he got hit on the bicycle. The defendant demurred and said, I don't understand your complaint. The judge said, no, we deny the demur. So the plaintiff still is good, right? But behind the scenes, we really had wished he had gotten rid of it, see? Because we wanted to rewrite that complaint. So, but what we did, on the surface of it, we said, wait a minute. You're a magistrate. You can't make a decision. You can't make any decision. That's the prerogative of the, of the, uh, of the tribunal. So we vacated his decision. It's gone. And then we said, all right, now that we vacated it, the plaintiff must file a brand new uh, action in response to the demur, and the plaintiff has only so many d- days to do it. So you set it up where you can win. No, we set it up to order ourselves to revise the action. Okay? Well, all we're doing is fi- we're going to fix some problems, that, some mistakes that were made before. Okay? Yes. When he got a uh, consultant to confer with and find out what was wrong with it. Why didn't he just file an amended pleading at that point? Because the demur had been filed. Okay. Yeah, if there had been nothing filed, he could have revised it any time. Uh, you can revise uh, an action as many times as you want until you serve somebody with it. Once you serve somebody with it, you've triggered the process and now you cannot amend it unless you get permission of the court. Okay? Okay. Do you have a statute of limitations? Uh, yeah, on, on the one I filed, I filed in the federal district court and I did not serve the defendants. To my I did, knowledge. I, re- I, I, re- I retained a right to amend the complaint? To my knowledge, first of all, you don't retain a right to complain, amend the complaint because once a person is served with it... They haven't served. Did not serve. Well, if you never serve, well, you don't have to claim the right. You just amend it. Okay. You, know. you have to do that within the statute. Not under, but if I if I if I'm amending it under common law now, I'm coming back in under common law. There is no statute of limitations under under common law. That's right. 
Yeah. Now I understand. Yeah. Okay. Declare it in the points and authorities. Okay. See, when you're at law, there's no statutes, okay? But look, you, you have to pay attention to the rules of fair play. Look, what is a court? The actual, we know that the technical definition of a court is a person in suit of the sovereign. But let me give you the real definition of a court. It is a stage upon which you put a show to convince the rest of the world that the sovereign is right. Or maybe wrong. You know, um, if, let me give an example. Uh, you're in your throne in your castle and you look out through the window and you see somebody stealing oranges off your tree, some knave. So you send the guard out. You say, go get him. So he goes out, he gets him. You say, put him in the dungeon. Okay? Isn't that what sovereign kings did in those days? Well, that's fine. You know, that would work. But, there's dungeon visiting day. And the, uh, the knave's brother comes over to visit him and he, he complains about how terrible he was treated, how he was unfairly thrown into the dungeon. And, you know, all sorts of claims, all right? And his brother basically believes him. He knows him. He says, well, he says, bro, he says, he says, don't worry. He says, I'm going to take care of that for you. Okay? And so, that night the brother who happened to be the chief cook makes the meal and the king is no more. Okay? Problem solved, sort of. Now, let's change this scenario a little bit. Same deal. The knave's out there. The, the uh, king orders the, the guard out. Guard picks him up, brings him before the king. And the king says, Knave, you're accused of stealing oranges off the orange tree. And how do you plead? And the knave says, I didn't do it. I'm innocent. And then the, the king says, well, okay, we'll have a trial. So they have the trial. And it's announced. They, they set a trial date. They have the announcement. The whole court shows up. Even the court jester is there. And uh, the prisoner's brother is there. And they watch this trial take place. And all the evidence is presented. And, then the, and if he wants, he gets a jury. And the jury convicts him. And then they throw him in the dungeon. Okay? The result is the same, isn't it? But with one important difference. And that is, come dungeon visiting day, the uh, brother goes and visits him, and, and this guy complains about how he's mistreated, unfairly accused, and so forth. And the brother says, well, bro, he says, you know, you kind of earned your stay here. He says, I saw the trial, I saw the evidence, and you're where you deserve to be. I'm sorry. Okay? And the king gets to live another day. See? So that's what the court is for. Look, the king knows what happened. He saw it. The king was the victim. And the other guy who did the deed, he knows what happened. So neither one has to prove anything to the other. So you have this court proceeding to prove it to the rest of the world. And that's what a court really is. And that's why it is it's important that you write these papers this way and show the fairness. Be a benevolent king don't grab everything that you think you can. Don't do these $30 billion suits against the city of Santa Barbara or whatever. You know what I'm saying? You've you, you, you got to stay within acceptable limits because, remember, the whole purpose of a lawsuit is to convince the rest of the world that you're right. That's all it's for. That's the real purpose of a court. And you should take that very much into account. And there's a lot of people who do look at your records First of all, on the first surface, there's the judge and attorneys. On the second level, there's clerks, there's newspaper reporters, there's other judges. You know, they're going to form an opinion out this. And if you have an unusual case where you're really pounding on them, you might have a lot of people looking at it. They're seeing how you handle this. So you want to get those people on your side. And you're not going to do it if you become overly demanding. You've got to stay within some reasonable whatever custom and usage is, okay? 
Because you want that background support. Yes. <coughs> okay. Not familiar with the term, but okay. <laughs> but anyhow, so, okay, going on this case. <coughs> Further, let's see. Oh, we said we, got a, we ordered him to file it within a certain time. Okay, and then it goes on. He says, uh, further the court orders that the defendant, that if the defendant chooses to file an answer to the first amended action, then the filing fees paid for the answer filed and the rescinded order are applied to that answer to the first amended action. For the court wills not the pains of its error on the defendants. Okay, we're just saying, look, uh, you know, some of these courts, they actually charge you for filing an answer. And so we ordered that those fees, whatever he may have paid, if he did file an answer, because we weren't sure at the time, he said, look, these fees are transferred over to the other answer. We're not going, just because the court made a decision, it does not mean that the defendant is going to suffer further. Okay? As it turned out, we were wrong. That particular court didn't have fees for answers. <laughs> That's showbiz. Anyway, um, at that time, I don't know what they're doing now. Okay. <clears throat> Further, the magistrate, plaintiff, and defendants are invited to each file and serve on all other interested parties a brief no later than June 7, 99, to show cause to this court why this order should not take effect or should be modified. The court, mindful of the rights of the parties and the importance of fair play, will liberally construe the arguments presented. So, what we're saying, look, you'll note, you remember before, the court on its own motion did these things, right? Well, when you act on your own motion, that is essentially an unfair maneuver because nobody had a chance to defend themselves from whatever you're doing as a court. So, any time you issue any order for anything on your own motion without the, all parties being apprised of it, any time you do that, you should always issue an order to show cause, which is what this really is, telling them, let us know if we're wrong. Okay? Maybe there is another point of view. Yes? When you file in form Pauper. of papyrus, that uh, how, how are you acknowledged as a king when you do that? Um, I've never had a problem with it. Okay, all you're saying, to me, all you're saying is you don't have any money. Okay, you do know that some courts may have a seal and others don't have a seal. Why? Well, I'll tell you something. The metallurgists are pretty expensive. And you have them make you a, a kingly seal, a sovereign seal, that costs money. And there were poor kings at times. They couldn't afford such things. So courts didn't always have seals. Especially had this is Microphone. Yeah, more exercise. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that you're still working on this. It's been over four years. Yeah, we this 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 case was an intentionally slow case because we were we were setting up an example. We knew this in advance. The plaintiff was in no hurry. He wanted to wanted to do a perfect case where we covered everything. We were really intended to do a perfect case. We just never expected to have an opportunity to find a judge in contempt of court. That was a bonus feature. I, I think I'm familiar with the case. Yeah. yeah it's, on the, it's on the internet. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but anyway, always, anytime you issue an order like that on your own motion or on the court's own motion, always, always, always give the parties a chance to tell you you're wrong. Just basic courtesy, okay? Okay. All right. Further, the case management conference scheduled for May 7th will be reset to a date determined by the clerk no later than September 6th unless for good cause. That phrase, good cause, is a technical, that's called a term of art. That's a technical phrase. Good cause means you better have a good legal reason. Good cause does not mean, oh, gee, you have a good, strong moral point, and yeah, we ought to be nice guys and let you have that point. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Good cause always means you better have a good, strong, legal reason for whatever it is. And it, so, and we, we set a good date so that, you know, she had wiggle room. All right. Now, you've seen 
the initial transcript of what the judge you got a you got a measure of the judge's attitude, right? And you got here here's an order directly attacking the judge's order. This is a writ of error. Okay? So we got we got all that. Now we we were very strong. We told him he he usurped the the judicial and legislative powers of the court, didn't he? That's what we told him. Yes, you have a question. Uh, Bill, a question. Does this does this kind of a procedure work uh, if, if you're in, involved as a um, defendant and you want to turn it around, if you're in, in divorce court, uh, no, child settlement no, cases? No, it only works if you're the plaintiff.